the man come in here, call you a boy, tell you to get up off your ass and rehearse it. You ain't had nothing to say except, yes, yeah, so. sir. <laughs> I can say yes, sir, to whoever I please. What you got to do with it? I know how to handle white folks. I've been handling them for 32 years. Now, you going to tell me how to do it? Just because I say yes, sir, don't mean I'm spooked up by him. I know what I'm doing. Let me handle it my way. Well, go on and handle it then. Because, you know, you're always messing with somebody. Always agitate somebody with that old philosophy bullshit you be talking. You stay out of my way about what I do and say. I'm my own person. Just let me alone. All right, all right, Levy, you right. I apologize. <laughs> Ain't none of my business you spooked up by the white man. <laughs> all right, see, that's the shit I'm talking about. Y'all back up and leave Levy alone. Oh, come on, <laughs> Levy. We was all just having fun. Because you know ain't said nothing about you. He ain't said about me. You just taking it all wrong. <laughs> ain't meant nothing by it. Levy? Levy got to be Levy. You don't need nobody messing with him about the white man. Gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Good evening. You're listening to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. We thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoy another exciting episode of our show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Straight Talk with Dean and Mar. Ten days left in 2020, and then we head on to 2021. But what you just heard was an excerpt from uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. It's on Netflix right now. It's the last performance of the great Chadwick Boseman. And if you get a chance, make sure you go and check it out. But um, we're going to get to the show right now. So it's the six-man theme, Geronimo. From NJ to NC, I'm in the studio with my right-hand man, Mark Lee. So, Mark, tell me what's good in your neck of the woods, my brother. Well, you know, all kinds of good, good things in my neck of the woods. You had me a little confused there because I was sitting there going like, what the heck am I listening to as we get ready to have everything to turn off? So, I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? Did I step into the middle of something? Did I not know what's happening here? What's going on here in the wonderful <laughs> world of straight talk? So y'all had me a little confused there, but I see that it was Ma Rainey, and that is a great thing. I'm hearing great things about that production on Netflix. I need to get and check it out. You know, I was over there at Hey Town, you asked what's going on, and we mm-hmm. had the Black Santa Claus. So we had Black Santa Claus over at the Hey Town both Saturday and uh, Sunday. Uh, steady flow of parents and their kids came in. Including one dog. That's right, one dog came dressed up in his Christmas outfits and everything to take pictures as well. So they were there. Um, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic, so not as many people as has been in the past. So did not have as much of a crowd as usual. So they've actually wrapped it up for this year. But I think they're going to do a play by uh, later on or something along those lines. So there's still some opportunities for people to see Black Santa Claus and everything of that nature so that's one of the things that is going on in town and i've got to go back over there on wednesday because you know even when the building is closed you still got to have your crews come in whether that's the exterminator whether that's the plumber whether that's the whoever and we got to have somebody come in and do some uh standard ma- uh, maintenance standard upkeep so i will be there on wednesday morning dealing with some standard upkeep standard maintenance but you know one thing i can tell you is that anytime that things happen then folks get new toys. So we're actually getting some streaming equipment at the hay side that's getting installed and we're getting some video cameras and they're also getting some uh, new alarm systems and a lot of other new things. So, you know, okay. things are getting upfitted and getting redesigned and getting into a better situation. So whenever we get out of this whole craziness, then there will be a even nicer, shinier new building that folks can check out and all of that. So that's one of the things that's going on I know mm-hmm. that, like you, you've probably been following what's going on in the news, and I see that you've got and a uh, bill that's coming due that's supposed to get us some money in our pockets. I know I could use the money in my pockets, but I've been told that that money may not show up till you know, January, February, who knows, maybe March or April, because, you know, even though that passed, they still got to, like, get it through and get it into your pockets and all that. And I hear they're going to try to 
um, what you call it, uh, fast tracking. But you know, Washington's idea of fast tracking and my idea of fast tracking <laughs> may not be the same thing. Because my idea of fast tracking is, you know, pass the bill, uh, you know, call some people real quickly, and it's in my account by like Friday or Saturday. But I don't think that's Washington's idea of fast tracking. I think their idea of, you know, uh, pass the bill, do lots of hemming and hawing. You lots to have talking about, we did this, we did that, we did this and that, and then you might get it in his March or April. That's, that, that's well, the Washington idea of Fast Track it is, but maybe you've heard differently, and I'd like to hear well, what you've heard. Yeah, the article that I had pulled up, um, it said that the uh, second round of stimulus checks will be landed in the bank accounts of millions of Americans. It's a $900 billion economic relief package. It was agreed to actually on Sunday. Um, well, yesterday, and right. instead of it being twelve hundred dollars per person, this time it's going to be six hundred dollars per person. And they said the stimulus checks could start reaching people's bank accounts as early as next week. However, one group of people will receive more money in the second round of stimulus checks than the first, and those are dependent children who will receive the same six hundred dollar checks as adults up from the $500 checks that they received through the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, as for short. You know, so I guess they said, well, we're going to give everybody $600 this time. You know, single people earning up to $75,000 will receive 600 bucks, while married couples earning up to 150000 will receive $1,200, exactly half of the amount paid out earlier this year. Um, the second round of checks that have the same type of income phase out as in the CARES Act, but the stimulus checks reduced for earnings above $75,000 per single person or $150,000 per married couple. So the amount of payment individuals receive will be reduced by $5 for every $100 of income earned above those thresholds. And it will be phased out entirely for single people earning over $87,000 or married couples earning more than $174,000. So it, it's, <laughs> man, listen, it, it's still not enough. You know what I mean? Like, no, 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 that, you know, I had a bucks. very interesting conversation. I had a very interesting conversation with a young lady that uh, I've become friends with that works at one of these Korean restaurants. She's actually, I believe, of Mexican descent. And she was like saying, let, let me get this straight. And this is almost her exact word. Let me get this straight. So, um, and she's a single young lady. She says, so as the first check I got was $1,200, the next check would be $600. So basically the government is saying that I'm supposed to have survived off of $1,800 in a whole year. Good right. luck with that. That was kind of her attitude. Right. Like, good luck mm-hmm. with that. I, I mean, to be honest, man, you know, like you're spending money. You spent money on a space force. You're going to call them guardians. I guess guardians of the galaxy, like the Marvel comic or whatever, but now you have money for what are they defending? You know what I mean? It, it's not like Star Wars out there. I mean, it's no... Well, well supposedly <laughs> they're defending this wall. But I also understand that there's a lot of this money if you go down there that they're going to spend to put 56 miles on that wall against Mexico. And like I was telling are you, you serious? Lady, last time I checked, yeah, there's a passage in there where they're going to get they're going to fund, I think it's 56 miles of Trump's wall that he wants and oh everything. And that's one of the things that they did say that they were going to fund. And the last time I checked, and I, you know, we talked about this on this show before in the past, you know, I've not done a lot of construction work. I can't say that I've done any in my life, but I've done some work with some people that have done construction work and things of that nature. And the last time I checked, a lot of times, the folks that are at those construction sites, it's a lot of Latin American folks, a lot of, you know, uh, yeah. folks of Mexican descent, other descent. There might be some brothers and sisters, might be some uh, white folks there, might be some other folks there. But I would say that the vast majority of the crews that I've seen look very brown and very Latin. So if you're building a wall in Texas, I put so many trap doors in that wall, it ain't funny. I'm got, I'm, and I'm animal did, animal did instructions. I would be like, look, if you see that, if you see that thing that looks like a phone, it's not really a phone. Just like cap it, it'll open the door. Get, got it? <laughs> Up to Man, listen. If, if they could get a whole tunnel to get El Chapo out of prison, I'm quite sure they'd be able to make some things happen. So that wall is a waste of money, dog. It could go to, you know, people in this country that are actually 
um, in need. You know, I'm not going to say suffering, but at the same time, they are in need and it would be wiser for our country to use funds in that way. That wall means nothing. I mean, to this day, you have individuals who get deported and within 90 days, they're back in the country. You know, so like I said, that that wall it, makes no sense to me whatsoever. I do not get the wall. I don't get that at all. But you know, we also got like some real crazy uh, folks that you know think they can get away with drug stuff as well. Because I know you were talking about what's happening in North Carolina, but we had a major drug bust. I think they busted them for like cocaine, heroin, and everything else. And yes, it involved fraternities from Duke, UNC, and Appalachian State. And apparently, some of them graduated like years ago, and they have now been busted. And they were part of like a big sting that they are still feeling the repercussions from. Because, you know, they but they were college kids. And they thought that they could just get away with a little bit of any old thing. So they have now been caught and will have to pay the repercussions. So, so they have been definitely busted. And like I said, I know those were three universities that were included. There might have been others as well. But, yeah, it was a major drug bust. And like I said, I think there were some current students and a bunch of those that graduated within like the last 10 years or so. So. Definitely, that's one of the things that's been going on here. And then, of course, we got folks that are getting stupid, popping off at each other with weapons and things of that nature. So, and then, right. of course, we got the vaccine rolling out because there's finally the folks are rolling out on the vaccine. But I did hear a scary stat, and I want to know what you think about this. Speaking of scary stats, I was watching the news yesterday, and I think he's come down. But I was watching our good friend Lippy Roy. You know, Lippy's been on our show a couple of times, and she's now with MSNBC and. NBC and a couple of those kind of networks and everything, and now she was appearing on our friend Tree's show. And what she said is that I think it was her that said that she heard that Mr. Fauci, you know, the man with the plan, with the uh, kind of like the real man with the plan in terms of the way we should deal with this and everything, he is like, I want to say 300,000 on the vaccine list. If the head medical man is 300,000 on the vaccine <laughs> list, what the heck do you think we are? <laughs> Like maybe one million, but this is a head man, and they said he was like it might have been like three forty thousand or something like that. Whatever it was, they did say he climbed up, but he hadn't climbed up that. Much. He was still like three hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand. That means the common man like me and you, Mister Dean Geronimo, are probably down there at the millions. But you know what? Uh, you never know though, because you know even though that's a list, but I'm quite sure. I mean, there've been places where. I've worked, and, and before everybody else get their stuff, you're like, go ahead, get yours. And, you know, like, so it's possible he already got his shot. And he's like, yo, That's just put me, on the, put me on the list. I don't care where you put me. You know what I mean? So now he's way down there on the list. Man, he got his shot. As soon as they broke the packaging out of that joint, he's like, yo, let me get that real quick. You know what I'm saying? This is a little bit, boom, got mine. All right, well, the rest of the world can do what it wants. I don't care where you put my name. You put my name at the back of the list. So, you know, what we see and what happens in a lot of cases sometimes are different. I'm not saying that that's what happened, but it's possible that it could have taken place. You know, it's very possible because I'm quite sure I'm not going to sit there and do all this research and stuff and then it gets there and and I'm like yeah you're last no I'm not I'm first in fact (laughs) let me administer my own shot and my my little muscle tissue all right this one was already open you know (laughs) you know so sure nah it wouldn't be me waiting for that Mm -mm. be like John Q up in that joint like hey uh we about to turn this whole place up if I don't get my shot nobody's getting anything. I will flip all this stuff over. We start over again. You know, so we got somebody at the door, man. And, um, I, saw, I heard there was somebody at the door. We didn't see yeah, the, door. the doorbell, doorbell, doorbell rang a few minutes ago, so you know, we're going to get ready to find out who's at the door and um, we're going to take care of that right now. Alright. Let's see if we can get them in. Welcome to Straight Talk with Dana Mark. You are now on the line. Tell us who you are and where you're calling from. Hey, Dana Mark. This is Jill Van Nostrand calling from sunny New Jersey. Hey, what part of New Jersey? South, Central, or North? North Jersey. 
Okay, I'm at the bottom, and I'm in the southern end. <laughs> awesome. I'm I'm in a little town called Hewitt, New Jersey, and we're uh, right next to the Orange County border with New York. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Welcome. Thank you. So so, so great so to be here with you both. Glad that you could call in, Jim. Definitely was looking forward to having a conversation with you and everything. Jim has been involved in a lot of things. He's involved in the financial world. He's involved in the uh, has been involved in the past in the musical world and all of that. But I'll let Jim tell a little bit about himself because he's got a very rich history that has included a number of things. So definitely he's been involved in a lot of things, including having had the opportunity to be involved in the, the major uh, kind of like musical communities around New York and all of that. And then she got part and said, hey, I think I want to go become a financial person and get out of this entertainment game. I wish I had been smart <laughs> like that, but no, I had to be silly and still stay in the entertainment and TV and games. But no, she got smart and got into something that was more reasonable and all of that. But I'll let you learn more about this amazing lady and what she's got going on and everything. Oh, Mark, thank you so much. It's so nice to be here with you both. Such a pleasure uh, to hear all the really interesting conversation about these great topics that are going on today. And, and uh, just in terms of where I come from, I was in, I was a freelance musician in New York for many years. I was uh, very fortunate to uh, have come back to New York in the early nineties. And as a French horn player, I had some success on Broadway, did a bunch of shows with that and some, uh, some of the, uh, really great orchestras that we have in New York, and I was so lucky to be in that beautiful, uh, that beautiful community, and being a musician in New York for about 20 years, and uh, just loved, and and I certainly uh, missed that part of my life very much. It was just a, a wonderful time, and uh, since then I have gone into finance, and I have uh, become a financial advisor, and I certainly work with a lot of people who are in the arts, and all the things, Dean and Mark, that you have been talking about so far this evening, so important for all of our uh, brothers and sisters in the music community and all the arts community in New York, and uh, just certainly trying to help as many people as possible through this difficult time, difficult in many ways, uh, in addition to uh, not being able to have our performances in New York and just wondering what's going to happen with all of that going forward and trying to stay as positive as possible. And I know I talked to many people who are musicians and artists in the city and, and uh, they are working to stay very positive and trying to get through this and hopefully open back up this coming summer. Yeah, I know that they've got to be hoping that they'll <laughs> get a chance to open up. I know that I just recently heard that part of that package that was and put in place was going to be going some specific money for live venues and for uh, mm-hmm. bars and clubs. So hopefully that money will come in place and that can help them open up sooner versus later. Because I know there had been talk that they might not be able to open until like the uh, late uh, summer or early fall. Yep. And hopefully some yep. of this money will uh, encourage folks to get that money and open up sooner. And maybe we can have it even uh, going by full force by uh, spring or summer versus what we had heard earlier, assuming that this package uh, can give all of that relief that folks would like to have happen and everything. But I was just wondering, when you talk to your musician friends, what have their uh, perceptions been as to how they're surviving? I know in our conversations you told me that you've been keeping in touch with a number of them, so I was wondering what do they tell you about how they are surviving and what they're doing to stay afloat while they're trying to wait for the government to do what it will do and waiting for the um, yeah, um, the cures to come around and everything along those lines, so they can actually get back to some sense of normality. Yes, fortunately, uh, most musicians have been able, at least the ones I've spoken to, have been able to get unemployment, even if they are technically self-employed through this period. And it's been really, really difficult. It's it's hard to uh, to maintain your skills and maintain your your uh, place in the community and in the scene when there is no scene right now. And they're all just working really hard to, to be as flexible. And as you know, musicians are very resilient people. They're very hopeful people. They're very much uh, hopeful people. And they think about the future. They are always looking to grow and learn. And many of them have, have uh, taken on other sources of income 
throughout this period, and uh, some of them have been working hard to improve their skills and, and even learn to, how to do some different things. So it's a combination of uh, being supported as much as possible through our stimulus programs and uh, different ways to support people who haven't been able to work throughout this period, and also with them just being really resilient and smart and, and uh, very uh, thoughtful people who are doing what they can to also help their own situation. So it's, it's all about just trying to move forward as much as possible and maintain as positive an outlook as possible. Uh, that makes a lot of sense and everything. And uh, when you've been talking to folks, what is uh, well, a couple of questions that just popped in my head. Like I said, we've definitely had the pleasure of talking a couple of things. Just really, 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 really. Yeah. Some of the things that you enjoyed about and what were some of the highlights in your musical career? And in the second part of that question, is what led you to go more into the financial aspect of life? And uh, do you have any regrets about going into the financial? Aspect, or you just glad to turn that leaf from the music community? Oh, Mark, I, I, the, I did not hear the first part of the question, but I heard the second part. What was the first part again? Uh, no problem. The first part was I was asking uh, what were some of the highlights in your musical career when you had that musical career yep. going, and, yep. and uh, so I want you to share some of those highlights. Sure, thank you. That I, I've had some really, really wonderful uh, experiences being a musician in New York, of course, musicians are just, it's such, just a wonderful community and high level of musicianship there. Uh, some of the highlights I would say were playing with uh, Thomas Buckner's group called Mutable Music, which was, which is still a very thriving, uh, lively new music, modern music uh, 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 ensemble in New York and also being able to go all around the country with them. That was really wonderful. I, I absolutely love what they're doing at Mutable Music with supporting the composition of new music in New York, which as we know needs a lot of support because we, we have to have new music and we have to be growing and uh, developing and evolving all the time. I'd say another great highlight in that vein also was with the SEM Ensemble led by Peter Kotick in Brooklyn Heights. And that, that's just a wonderful group, also new music. And uh, what Peter's been working to accomplish and his goals with the group over the past 30 or more years have just been tremendous and was having different uh, collaborations with like the Art Ensemble of Chicago. I remember working with Muhal Richard Abrams, very, very wonderful performance at um, – at some different art venues in uh, in and around New York, really wonderful. I'd say a couple of other highlights were playing with the Orpheus Ensemble with uh, my old teacher, David Jolly, playing French horn with him. That was certainly tremendous. And, uh, you know, doing the, doing my shows, I certainly loved all the Broadway shows I did. Uh, some, some of my favorites were Tommy and uh, Wicked, Billy Elliot. They were certainly tremendous. And I would say I certainly miss, <laughs> as you were saying, Mark, I certainly do miss the camaraderie of fellow musicians and uh, being around like-minded people in that way, you know, people who are uh, art artists and they're, they're working together, playing together, making, making music and, and making art. That is certainly something that I do miss. I, I went into finance. For a couple of reasons, uh, I was interested in business. I was interested in uh, financial topics, uh, basically for my whole life. It was something that had been part of uh, different people in my family, jobs that they had had, careers that they'd had. And at one point, my my father had Alzheimer's, and he and my mom were just having a, a really difficult time with their finances. And and I I was coming in and, and learning as much as I could and helping them as much as I could. And, and I just got really fired up about seeing other families also going through what my own family was going through. And I just got so involved in it and so passionate about it that I just felt like it was going to be the direction I was going to take the rest of my life in professionally. 
And I, I do still, of course, love uh, the, the horn. I love playing the horn. I love playing with other people. But I do feel that this is the right place for me to be right now. And helping people with their finances is my passion in life. And it, it's just something that I'm really thankful to be doing and, and very thankful to uh, just be able to be in that position where I can spread some knowledge and spread a lot of education and help as many people as I can. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the things I was curious about, you talked about the finances and everything, and I know a lot of folks are very much concerned about their own finances with yep. all that's going on in the world and everything. So I was just wondering, what is the uh, number one misconception that you think people have about financial planning? Because I know a lot of times, you know, it takes something like a uh, pandemic or sometimes unemployment yep. to knock people on th- their feet in order for them to realize how close they are to being um, in those yep. poor statuses and things of that nature. I know that we're still having folks now that are now realizing that they were probably a half a check away from uh, being in the poor yep. house as opposed to the standard two yep. checks away that we had always heard that folks were thinking that they were, but folks are finding out that it's more like a half a paycheck away from being in the poor house. So I was just wondering, what is some of the advice that you've been giving to people, even in these difficult times? I would say that's a great question. I, I think in terms of the short term, uh, really, really getting a hold on, on the budget and how much is going out, how much is coming in and how much is going out. It's, it's got to even up, right? Or it's got to be in the positive. And a lot of times I've found throughout different talks I've given in this past year or uh, seminars, things like that, that people are not sure of what is going out in terms of their budget every month or every year. They're not sure where it's going. And I do spend a lot of time with clients just helping them get organized with their finances so that they can actually see what's going on. Because if you can't, if you don't see what's happening or if you're not aware of what's happening, you can't change it. And a lot of times when people see, oh, wow, you know, this is, this is what's going on here. You know, maybe I could make some changes and improve the situation. And I'm always working to help my clients get to the point where they can start to save and they can, can start to uh, grow their wealth and put some money to the side. Uh, that's, that's the ultimate goal. And I, I think, Mark, in terms of misconceptions, a, a lot of people, you know, some, some people out there in, uh, in the entertainment world, in finance, enter, financial entertainment, I'll say, they put forth this idea, or this, it's, to me it's a failed strategy, but this idea of paying off all of our debts before we can start saving. And to me, that's just antithetical to the idea of saving. And we need to save. We all need to put more away. And we, we can work on the debt for sure. Everybody wants to pay off their debt. But if we, don't, if we lose time that we could be using to save as we're eliminating our debt and as we're improving our spending habits and, and growing as much as we can, uh, we're going to be successful that way. But we need to start saving as soon as we can, even if it's a very small amount, start building in these great habits and build on them. Yeah, because that was one of the things, and I know we've talked about this with some of our uh, past guests that have been health food advocates and things of that nature, is that too often we have folks, and I'm guilty of it, I know others that are regular callers and listeners are probably guilty of it as well, but we spend way too much time eating out, and we know that that's probably not mm-hmm. helping with our economic finances, mm-hmm. but I do find a lot of times entertainers do that, a lot of times folks that are having jobs that are causing them to be away from their kitchens and everything oftentimes yes. do it as well. So what is some of the advice that you give in that regard? And another thing that I know a lot of times people are oftentimes concerned about is student loans. And definitely we've got a number yep. of kids that are now going into student loans uh, and still continue to go into student loans, even though the whole way of education is changing with it being more hybrid now, but that doesn't stop the loans from coming. So I know yep. those have probably got to be two areas that folks are very much concerned about. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on both getting away from the uh, maybe eating out as often and definitely ways that we can uh, deal with the student loans. Because, I mean, if you take the student loan out, then you've got to pay it back at some point. Absolutely. Great point, Mark. Very well said. I'd say in terms of eating out, eating out to me represents 
something that we do have some control over. As you were saying, people who are uh, out and about all day, it can be kind of difficult to always bring food or pack food with them. But uh, whatever we decide we, we need to do or what we can do in terms of our budget, whatever we can uh, eliminate from the budget that is something that we can control, that can be a great help. Because there are things that are in our monthly budget certain things that we can't really control, right? Like our rent or our mortgage, or uh, sometimes we can control our gas, but maybe we have a car payment, things like that. So there are some things we can look at it this way, controllables and things that we cannot control, things that are, um, that are going to be fixed no matter what happens pretty much. So if we really focus on the things that we, that we can, uh, that we can affect and that we can change, like you were saying, deciding, maybe to cut down on eating out. I mean, I know if I ate out less and, and I have, I, along with a lot of people have cut back on that this summer, um, a lot of, for a lot of reasons, because we haven't had a lot of restaurants open this summer in New Jersey and New York, but, uh, but it is a lot of times healthier for us and also healthier for our bottom line as well. Uh, things of that nature. So it involves a lot of planning, a lot of uh, thinking ahead and thinking about what is in my budget and what's important to me to keep and what can I, what can I change so that I'm going to redeploy or reallocate that money and those funds and put that into something for uh, my own protection, like having an emergency fund or having uh, working on our retirement funds, which we know we all need definitely. And, and then when it comes to student loans, I would say a couple of things are really important. Of course, as you're saying, Mark, we've gone virtual for our teaching, but, Student loans haven't changed. The cost of tuition, I haven't heard about any of it changing anyway uh, in the past year just because we're, all, we're doing virtual teaching. Uh, but the student loans, I would say if a, if a person can get that student loan monthly amount to the lowest possible amount, that's going to be the most beneficial for them in the long run. Because if we focus on getting that amount as low as possible, we just work it into the budget and we go on with our lives, and we focus on being great earners and uh, enjoying our lives, accomplishing our goals, that's going to be much more beneficial and we're going to be able to grow wealth and grow our assets while we're, we're working on that debt. But what we don't want to do is focus all of our efforts on paying off that debt uh, as soon as possible to the detriment of everything else in our lives. Because when we're focusing on growing our debt, it's a positive focus, we're moving forward and, you know, the student loans are there for our education. We, we got our education. It's, you know, it's in a way, it's not always bad debt. Uh, we're able to earn our own livings. And we need to focus on uh, getting that debt as small as possible in terms of a monthly payment. And then maybe even looking into getting into a forgiveness program or uh, looking at ways. I'm sorry, go ahead. You want to say something? No, go ahead. I was um, I was interested in learning more about the forgiveness programs because I think a yep, yep. lot of times folks don't think about those. Yep, because they're certainly out there. Uh, people who work at a government agency or even certain nonprofits could qualify for these programs, and it's it's really important to to get it to get that monthly student loan payment as low as possible. I'm not a huge fan of having the student loan payment tied to our income income based. I'm not a huge fan of that because if we get a raise or if we if our business uh goes up then we have to pay an increased amount on the student loans. So I'm not a huge fan of that. I would rather see my client's income go up and have the student loan amount that payment stay the same. Uh another thing I'm not a huge fan of is turning a student loan into a home equity loan and and bundling that into a mortgage because then that debt is tied to the home or it's tied to our, our mortgage rather than being a student loan, which is a different kind of debt. So I say leave it a student loan, uh, try to get into a forgiveness program, get that as low as possible, talk to a student loan counselor, talk to people who are experts in student loans because they oftentimes they can help a lot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, Dean works with a uh, corrections office and everything of that nature. He's there in the New Jersey area. But do you get a lot of uh, 
advice or do you wind up giving a lot of advice to folks that have gone into the system in any form? And is there any different advice that you give to them as they have oftentimes been in a controlled environment where a lot of their finances have been pretty much controlled while they've been in the system and everything, but now that they're getting out in the public, then that changes mm-hmm. for them. So I was wondering if you had any experience with dealing with those folks that have made a transition from being within the system to without the system, because the dean has been working as a corrections officer for many years now. As a matter of fact, he's been, he can tell you more about what he does and everything, but he's been involved in that situation for a number of years. Great question. I, I have not worked with anyone who made that transition in from, uh, you know, from being inside to being back outside. But when it comes to the finances, there are a couple of things that, that, we, that we know, right? That we, we, need to, uh, we need to have some kind of income stream, right? We need to have, uh, and whatever that might be, there could be some, uh, whatever we can do to get back on track as soon as possible with having income and working on a budget. I mean, working on a budget to me is one of the basics in life. It's something that we need to do on a regular basis. We need to do, especially if there's any kind of change. And when you're talking about making a transition like that, it's, it's a really big change. And think about what are our priorities? Where do we want our money to go? Money, our dollars are like votes. You know, where do we want to vote with our dollars, right? And when we, when we come to a big transition like that, it's really important to uh, to maintain as much of a steady income as we can and to improve that over time uh, and just work on that, work on that budget. I mean, working on the budget to me is like going to the gym and working out. I have to go to the gym. I need to exercise a little bit or run around the neighborhood, uh, lift some weights, and I need to work on my budget. It's just different areas of life, same type of, same type of situation, like you were saying with the nutritionist before, Mark. I mean, we just, we, it's all about healthy living. It's all about wellness. In this case, financial wellness, but it's still a very big part of wellness because we know when we're not financially healthy, we have challenges in that area, we are very stressed out, and it can lead to, uh, it can lead to not feeling good about things. And if, when we get a handle on it, I've seen it over and over again where people go from feeling unsure to feeling confident about themselves and about the future. And it just makes a big difference in their lives. So, you know, any, any kind of work with that, I would recommend. I think it's going to be a big help. That makes a lot of sense and everything. <clears throat> now, one of the other platforms that I do shows on is um, the uh, – international broadcast media, which is a streaming podcast, but one of the founders is always talking about financial wellness and financial fitness and some of the same things that you just mentioned. But one of his arguments is that he feels, and I think some of the other founders feel as well, that there's not enough of us learning these skill sets in the grade school level. And I was wondering your thoughts on this as one that's been involved in this kind of financial space for a number of years, because he remembers going to school, that being Nick Valvedo, and like learning some of these skills as as a young man in the school system, but uh, we're not seeing enough of that, in his opinion, on the grade school level. And I was just wondering, do you agree with that and your thoughts about that? Is that something that we should get back to teaching? Because I remember a time when we had vocational training in our school system, whether that was learning auto mechanics, whether that was learning plumbing, Mm -hmm. whether that was learning a number Mm -hmm. of other things that we seem to have gotten away from. But as one in the financial space, I was wondering your thoughts on that. I love that, Mark. That that is just such a great point to bring up because uh, when I was in school, we did have some basic finance education, and I know that since my son has been in school, I think he had one hour of financial education, and uh, it just it does seem to have gone down over time. I'm actually involved with a program called Money Academy for Kids, and it's a program that one of my colleagues and I do at uh, in libraries around our area where we do educate young kids in grades two to five and help them learn all about money and about being entrepreneurs and, and uh, the basics of finance. It's really exciting. And I think if, if we're thinking of the schools as being there to teach people to be successful adults, if that is important in terms of our public school system and, and even our private schools, then financial education to me has to be in there because so many times people uh, people have failed or they, they are not having the success that they 
would like to have in their lives because they're just not familiar. Uh, They just don't know what they need to do. They're not being taught what to do. They're not being taught how to organize their finances. They're not being taught how to even pay their bills or how to stay on a schedule or how to come up with a budget and really thinking about how are we going to make our country better? How are we going to help people be more successful? I mean, as a public institution, the public schools, it seems to me uh, that could be an important part of the mandate and a really important reason why we can even keep evolving it and growing the schools uh, because to be a successful adult, to be a successful person, we need to have knowledge in many, many areas. I think anyone would agree with that. And leaving this out of the curriculum in any meaningful way, I think we're seeing the the real negative results of that over the past uh, 20 to 25 years. And uh, believe me, I'm all for having this uh, a part of the schools and having young people, especially in grade school, middle school, learning about these concepts and learning how to how to um, be successful with their money and manage their money in a way that's going to help them achieve their goals and dreams. Because that's what being a, being a financial advisor is all about. It's like a, a dream manager. That's how I think of myself, helping people do things that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And if we can start, the younger we can start with that, the better it is, I think. That makes a lot of sense. Now, the other thing that you had talked about, and I imagine it's probably also a deep concern for yours as well, is the fact that your, um, I think you said it was your dad had Alzheimer's, and I know we've had other guests that have had to deal with kind of those kinds yep. of situations and everything. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts about dealing with an Alzheimer's patient or a parent and everything, because I do know a lot of times folks are um, not aware of what they're getting into when they deal with folks that have either Alzheimer's or dementia or some of these other yep. ailments. Because I know that I talked to a gentleman who lives in Oregon, and I think that he went through a lot of research around that kind of stuff as well. So I'd love to hear some of the things that you've learned from uh, what you went through with your dad. Awesome. Yeah, that that's a really great topic and so important today because uh, what the number one wealth eroding event in this country for, for families and individuals, not, not just the people who are in long-term care, but their families is long-term care. And we know that people with dementia and Alzheimer's, and this definitely happened with my, with my dad, which was that over time uh, the expenses that are building up and, and growing as a person needs more care as they you know, as these, as these diseases uh, cause decline, It just grows and grows. It's a huge stress and strain on the families and the caregivers. And it's something that really uh, just destroys family financial bases. Uh, If a family has, uh, if if a person has long-term care insurance, that could be a huge, huge benefit. Uh, That's something to, to look into. Obviously, before we need it, you know, that would be something to look into definitely in the, in the 50s or, or 60s. But, you know, barring that, if that's not an option, then making sure that a person has a will done, a person has a power of attorney and a health care proxy uh, to help through these times, through these difficult situations. And having somebody who can help organize uh, medical visits and uh, help if people are coming, like in my dad's case, some really kind people came into the home and, and helped with him at home. And just having someone who can help organize all of those things is a huge relief and benefit to the family uh, because they, the caregivers need relief. You know, and it's, it's, some of it's financial and some of it is emotional and spiritual. And that is, that is something that, that is definitely really important. And also finding out about the benefits that people uh, are entitled to. They're entitled to, if they can have Medicaid, uh, help through Medicaid or or different hospice organizations, that can be a huge help. Um, I definitely learned a lot, have learned a lot about that and help people in those situations. And there, there are a lot, there's a lot of great information on the internet and a lot of great people out there who can help. It's just a matter of looking for help and asking a lot of questions and uh, making sure that the person who needs the care is getting all the, the assistance that they can get. 
and you know whether they have whether they get the care in the home or out of the home uh, that that's a decision for them and for the family and I think something that's really important is making sure that our families know what our wishes would be in that situation so that they can make the best decisions for us so you know having a will done and living will and, and making sure that all of our families know what we would want to have done in that situation is really, really important. Yeah, I can definitely understand yeah. that. <clears throat> what advice would you give to folks? I know I was talking to a friend of mine, and they've actually um, were saying how fortunate I am to still have uh, – both of my parents uh, live in and everything, and therefore when I'm in those financial strains, I'm able to reach out to them and the things of that nature. Try not to do it too often, but do still do it even at the uh, ripe old age of the late 50s and everything. And definitely there are folks out there like uh, Dean and others that have significant others, and it's a team effort when that's going on and everything. But what kind of advice as a financial planner do you give for those that don't have those kind of resources at their disposal? Because I know that when I've talked to a good friend of mine who is, um, I mean, he's got, he's divorced and he's got kids and everything, but the kids are with their mother and everything. So a lot of times he's finding that he's having to find these very difficult financial situations out on his own. So I didn't know what kind of advice you give to folks that may not have the resources of family that I may have or that Dean may have with his wife and others. So I was just wondering what kind of advice you give for folks that are in the more difficult kind of situations with the finances, because I do know a number of folks that are in those kind of uh, predicaments, for lack of a better word. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And if any, I say start with in terms of looking for, looking for just finding out about knowledge, get Find out what can be done. Where can we go? Um, what what um, benefits can, are we entitled to and can we get to improve the situation? Uh, in terms of health care, that's really, really important. If we can get health insurance uh, through the exchanges or if we have the opportunity to get it uh, through Medicaid, that can be a huge benefit because we need to maintain our health. More than anything, the health, our health is our most important asset. I think I truly believe that, and I think that's where that's where the beginning of financial wellness starts. And then just making sure that we are taking advantage of all the opportunities that we have uh, with different programs, and also with the current uh, current situation in terms of making sure that we're getting our benefits from the federal and from the state governments, because whatever we whatever assistance and, and revenue and income that we can have through this time is going to be a big help. And also working on the budget, working on being as efficient as possible, those are really important ideas for all of us uh, to, to hammer home. And working together as a unit with our families, with our friends. Uh, I know people who have even moved in together, musicians, during this time. And they've they've changed you know, they've changed the way they approach uh, their lives, and it's been it's been necessary through this period of time and very very this very very difficult and challenging period of time. Uh, but I do believe that we can get through it, and we will get through it. No, I definitely agree with you on that. What advice would you give to folks in terms of budgeting? And I know a lot of times we oftentimes think about budgeting. And, of course, there's mm-hmm. always the things that you know that you can budget and that you have to budget. I mean, everybody knows yep. that they're going to have to pay the rent no matter what the rent is. I mean, in some cases you might have to reduce the um, yep. the lifestyle that you're living in. Like if you're living in the high-rise mansion and you can't afford it, then yep. you might have to move to the lower class. Well, not lower class, but to the um, lesser priced apartment complex or something along yep. those lines and everything, and definitely, uh, but you're still going to have to possibly pay rent and or mortgage, and of course, just about every place you have to pay electricity. I know some places the water is included, but just about every place you have to pay yep. electricity, and um, you definitely have to, if you have the car, maintain the car and all of that. But what are some of the items that when you're talking to people about their budgets, you try to encourage them to either reduce or to cut down? I imagine part of that is, unfortunately, even though you are a former musician, the entertainment budgets, because I know that that's something that I've had to yep. cut yep. down quite often and everything. But what are some of the other things that you try to encourage people to reduce as they are trying to set and improve their uh, budgetary amounts? I say when it comes to the budget, what we, what we really need to find out 
is what is important to us. We need to think about what would we, what do we want to keep, no matter what. Where are we going? What are we going to keep, and what we're going to, what are we going to get rid of? Uh, I'd say once we figure that out, then we know what we can do. For example, as you were saying, with, with our housing, where we live, maybe we can stay in the same area, but move to a place that isn't, uh, you know, that's that's less expensive. Uh, when it comes to the, like you were saying, the utility bills and and uh, credit cards, stuff like that. I would say definitely contact all of those companies. If you're in distress, talk to them about it. All of these companies, or I'd say all the ones, I've heard about many, many companies that are working with people and helping them uh, have lower payments. They might have to, they might not forgive, but over time they're having people pay smaller amounts so that we can get through this time until we get back to normal and, and have normal uh, working opportunities. So I would say definitely contact any company that you have any kind of financial dealings with. Um, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Everything is negotiable. I say just about everything is negotiable uh, today, and, and it always has been. I would say talk to landlords. Talk to uh, any anybody else who we have dealings with with our finances and renegotiate. It's a different world. It's a different situation, and they should be open to doing that. Uh, I would say ask for any kind of help that you can and then use it to your advantage. Uh, in terms of cutting from the budget, I'd say anything that's non-essential. I mean, of course, uh, we, all, we need Internet connections. I mean, to me, that is something, for example, that I would not give up. But going out to eat, as you were saying, Mark, the entertainment budget, just temporarily kind of uh, bringing those back a little bit uh, so we can figure out how are we going to get through with what we have coming in and, and hopefully not building up debt also on the side. But I think it's really important to be realistic about what we're spending and what is really important to us. And I'd say most people would find or are able to find things that they are happy to eliminate from the budget when they see everything that they're going to get by doing that and how they're going to change their futures by doing that. So it, it's not easy. Believe me, I work with people on this every day. It's not easy. Uh, I, my own budget is a challenge, very challenging. Uh, so I think it's something that we just need to keep working on and figure out what are the non-essentials that we can eliminate, what are the things that we really want to keep, and focus on those and focus on improving our financial situation and improving our financial health. No, that makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> One of the things that I've been shocked at in terms of, like, just different careers and everything was I've actually got friends of mine that are in the real estate business, and quite yep. um, surprisingly, they've been doing actually fairly well in terms of, like, both commercial real estate and, in some cases, yep. even residential real estate, which actually surprised me since we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I was curious, is financial consulting doing well or not doing well in the middle of the pandemic? Because, like I said, I was actually surprised when my friend who is a photographer for his wife's real estate company as well as other real estate people as well as a gentleman that I know that has got a Durham-based real estate uh, company that he yep. worked with and somebody else that works in, like I said, the more commercial side. And in all the conversations, they've been like, nope, real estate's doing well. And then I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago, actually, at a fast food restaurant who was a car dealership person, and he was telling me that he was actually doing well because in um, unlike some states where I know that some states closed down their dealerships. <laughs> North Carolina did not do that. They actually had the dealership still open, yep. and he was saying that he's done quite well as well. So I was just wondering, uh, are you finding that your career in terms of financial consulting is doing well, and are there other careers like those that I mentioned that are surprisingly doing better than folks might expect they would be doing? Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, definitely in New Jersey, real estate is doing really well. It's It's kind of booming right now because uh, we're having a lot of people moving out of the city or other areas, and um, they are, they're looking to make a move, definitely. And there are other areas that you were talking about are doing well also in New Jersey, very similar. It's, it's just a, a matter of, believe me, on my part, being so extremely thankful to, have the, to be privileged enough to be able to keep working from home 
and to be able to keep helping people uh, throughout this time. Uh, financial services, in terms of my, my part of it, uh, working with people, working with individuals and business owners and families, every, people still need help with their finances. Uh, so if anything, I've seen an uptick in what we're doing at my firm and, and myself in terms of helping people because it's all about getting people through this time and coming out on the other end and being successful. So in terms of busyness, I'd say I'm extremely busy (laughs) and very, very thankful for that. Um, And often just helping people and talking to them and uh, giving them any any positive advice that I can and making recommendations. So it's not always just about making someone a client or it's helping someone and doing what I can to help them make their lives better. So I say doing great, very busy, and extremely thankful. And uh, just being here for my clients is a privilege and an honor. And anything that I can do to help anyone, I'm happy to do it. And what kind of clients do you look for in general? Because like I said, some people that may be listening, that are there in New Jersey like Dean as well as all up and down the East Coast and throughout the nation as well as throughout the world. They may be listening and going like, I need to talk to Jill. I've got some ideas that I need to be <laughs> dealing with and everything. So what do, you, what do you look for in the sense of a client? And does the client have to be there in New Jersey or can they be based anywhere in the world? Uh, I can have clients anywhere in the United States. And I I do have clients all over the country. I have a lot of clients, obviously, in New Jersey, in New York, Connecticut, this area. I have a lot of clients in North Carolina. Uh, My mom and my brother live in North Carolina. And and, uh, basically, in terms of a client, what I look for is just someone who wants to change their life. I don't have any minimums to work with anyone. I don't have any uh, requirements in terms of what they earn or anything like that. What, what I'm really looking for is someone who is ready to take action and ready to, to implement new strategies and improve their lives and uh, the lives of their families or their business. And to me, that's, that's the most important thing. If someone's ready to go, they want help, I'm ready to go too. That makes a lot of sense. Now, do you see any difference in the ways that people handle finances if, say, they're in the southeast, like North Carolina, Virginia, or <laughs> Georgia versus the northeast or versus the west coast? Are there any regional differences since, like you said, you can't take clients all over the country and everything? And I was wondering, have you observed any regional differences? And if so, what are those regional differences? That's a great question. I, I haven't, I haven't observed so much of differences in terms of what people care about. Cause I think people pretty much care about the same things. Uh, they want to protect their families. They want to protect themselves. They want to uh, improve their financial situations. They want to grow their wealth. They want to improve their businesses. But I'll tell you the people in the Southeast are extremely uh, friendly and, <laughs> and warm. And uh, the people in the Northeast, as you would probably think are, Uh, They want to do things very, very quickly, as fast as possible. And I'd say on the West Coast, uh, they're pretty laid back out there as well. And uh, and the heartland, they, you know, they're they're as solid as they come. So I definitely, Mark, noticed some differences in their in their demeanor and in their (laughs) in their uh, superior friendliness. and and that that's just wonderful to me. I just I love to talk to people all around the country and and I'm pretty good dealing with time zone changes, so not so bad on that front, thank goodness. And uh just, you know, just being able to help people and and talk to them about their lives and and help them achieve their goals. That's what that's what I'm in this for. And uh any good that I can do, I'm just thankful to be able to do it. No, that makes a lot of sense and everything. Now, do you ever regret not going back into the music field or being in the music field? And do you ever think that you want to get back into it and leave this lovely world of financing after we get done with this pandemic and you've solved everybody's financial problems? So do you ever miss the uh, entertainment aspect of what you did for about 20 years or so? Oh, Mark, I I miss it so much sometimes. I miss uh, playing I miss playing in orchestras and, and bands with people, and I, I miss that, that camaraderie and that sense of uh, just being so together and being close with other people. 
And, uh, of course, I, I do miss it. Uh, fortunately, I, I do still play in a couple of orchestras here in New Jersey. And so as soon as COVID is over, I hope that, uh, that we get back to it. One of them is the, the Riverside Symphonia in Lambertville, New Jersey, which is near and dear to my heart. And uh, they're, they're so kind as to keep letting me play there, <laughs> even though I am in finance now. But I think I'm in finance to stay. And uh, I, do, I do miss the music world, but I do have the memories, and I have a lot, lot, of, great, uh, lot of great pictures, too. So, you know, that's, that's uh, where I am today. Yeah, I'm sure you've got some of those great memories. If you would share with our audience some more details about some of those memories, like I said, you mentioned some of them, but I'm sure that we would love to hear some stories about some of the things that you were involved in in some of those great shows, and I'm sure that the audience would love to hear you share some of those wonderful stories about some of your past performances. Oh, I I love I I tell you I say one of the a couple of the highlights would be improvising with. Uh, Muhal Richard Abrams at the New York Studio School. That was tremendous. Uh, he's a wonderful musician. I, I love improvisation. I love improvising and and doing any kind of group improvisation like that is just really tremendous. Um, I, I also remember playing at Carnegie Hall with Orpheus and uh, Mozart symphonies there, Beethoven. Uh, just really wonderful and being in that beautiful beautiful space at Carnegie. You just It just can't be beat. It's just absolutely the, one of the most beautiful places to play in the whole world. And uh, I would say those are a couple of my favorite highlights. And uh, in terms of shows, I, I just miss Tommy. Tommy was my absolute favorite show I did. And uh, playing with that band, with those wonderful singers and actors up on stage, just a just a tremendous memory going all the way back to the early 90s 1992 i believe that was 1993 and uh just just wonderful musical and camaraderie experiences in new york and the best people in the world are in, musicians in new york and then going down to places like uh the knitting factory and smalls after our performances were over to go hear some some great jazz down there and uh, some modern, some new contemporary uh, classical music, just really wonderful experiences. And uh, those things you just never forget. They just stay with you forever. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, did you do any <laughs> of the traveling with Tommy? And if so, were there any places that you enjoyed traveling to, or were you pretty much just in that New York, New Jersey area, or did you get to do any of the uh, traveling shows? I did some traveling. Uh, not so much with the shows. Billy Elliot was the only one I, I did any traveling with. And I actually went to Durham with Billy Elliot uh, many, about 10 years ago or a little more than 10 years ago now, uh, maybe more like 13 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, but I love Durham. It's, it's a great town and we had so much fun there. But I'd say in terms of traveling, I was very, very fortunate to be able to go all over Europe and uh, spend a lot of time in the Czech Republic and Germany and uh, the Netherlands playing in different uh, halls there, a little bit in Russia, and uh, one, and uh, also going to Japan and the, the Far East. Those were some great experiences. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be playing in a, a brass quartet, which was part of a, a youth outreach program through Carnegie Hall. It was called Carnegie Kids. Uh, the program doesn't exist anymore, but... Uh, we would play in Carnegie Hall, and then uh, we went to Japan and would play over there for the kids over there. And uh, we had a terrific show. It was a pirate-themed show with an actor, and she was just tremendous. And uh, the kids over in Japan just loved, at the time, they absolutely loved uh, anything with a pirate theme. They just went crazy over there. But I've, I've been really, really fortunate to be able to travel and, and all over the United States. Um, I went with uh, Thomas Buckner and Mutable Music out to California and San Francisco many times and played out there to those wonderful audiences and, and just being able to feel a real connection between the performers and the, the audience and, and feel that, that uh, electricity there in, in those performances, just, just so wonderful. And uh, I do miss all of that very much. I miss the traveling 
uh, that is something that, that I really enjoy myself. I love getting on planes and going to see exciting new places and being able to play in different halls. Uh, I had the fortune to, to play in uh, the orchestra hall in Munich one summer uh, many years ago and, and wonderful orchestral music, uh, Pines of Rome, uh, some you know, different pieces, Beethoven, and, and just wonderful, wonderful pieces, wonderful places to go. <laughs> Sounds like some amazing memories that you had there and definitely some things that folks will be uh, interested to hear uh, your past recollections of all of those and everything. So hopefully as folks go back and listen to this, they'll hear those great memories and hear that smile in your voice because I can even hear it way over here as I was listening Aww. to you, just reflecting on all of those great memories and everything along those lines. Coming back to the financial aspect of your life and everything, one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of people right now, and it actually even thinks back to our artist community, are thinking yep. about – alternative kinds of ways of financing. I was wondering what your thoughts are about this. I've heard a lot of people that are now thinking about, you know, getting involved in the stocks or getting involved in the investment yep. trading. And I've even heard some people that have been considering getting involved in cryptocurrencies and things of that nature. Yep. And some of these seem like they could be more dangerous than others. But I do know yep. that a lot of folks mm-hmm. are trying to figure out different ways to maintain their sanity as well as their finances. So they are looking at some different things and that they are exploring. So what are your thoughts yep. about folks getting involved in investment or stocks? Is that something <laughs> that they should do research on before jumping into it? Cause I have heard a number of folks that are, you know, very much excited about wanting to get involved in the stock game or in the investment game or yep. wanting to get involved in cryptocurrencies because that seems to be <laughs> the latest thing that's out there. But I was just wondering some of your thoughts on that. Thank you for bringing that up, Mark. That, that, this is such an important subject. And I also have seen a real surge in, in people asking me questions about this. Like, you know, how can they get into it or should they get into it? What's, you know, what is the probability of success? And, and I think what you're, what you're saying about doing your research and making sure that you are uh, ver- that you're educated on what you're going to start doing and that you fully understand uh, both how it's going to be done and what you need in terms of resources to get started and what is the risk involved. Uh, there, you know, when, when we talk about trading stocks and uh, cryptocurrency, we need, we need to really know what we're doing before we really start dipping more than a toe into that, into that kind of that area, that field. Because uh, when people uh, who are, Professional traders, they, they have a ton of education. They have a ton of experience. They learn uh, beside people who've been doing this for, for their entire careers. So I do take it very seriously uh, when people ask me about, you know, should I start trading stocks? Should I start, should I look into cryptocurrency? And, and I'd say in, in the case of cryptocurrency, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Uh, but before we start really going into it, let's make sure we're really, really educated and we spend some time, spend time reading about it, learning about it, listening to people talk about it. Uh, What do the experts say? How do we get involved? Let's start small and we can build up. Uh, The same goes for for trading stocks. Uh, I'm I'm really in favor of uh, saving. I like to help people build some guarantees into their portfolios uh, when we go into trading stocks, we have to take it very seriously, do our research, make sure uh, that we are aware, we have our eyes open when we go into it. And, uh, you know, there are other ways that we can, that we can also invest in ourselves and in our futures. We can start small businesses. We can uh, do something in real estate. There are all different ways that people invest, right? So anytime we do that, the more we can arm ourselves with knowledge and talk to experts, ask questions, read what they write, listen to what they say, and lots of them, not just one person, not just one person, but many, and read on a daily basis. I think education is key here and making sure that we know what we're getting into before we take that leap. 
Yeah, but I can definitely understand that. What advice would you give to people that might be thinking that they want to get into real estate? Because you just mentioned real estate, and I do hear a lot of folks that that's another thing that folks oftentimes mm-hmm. think they want yep. to get into, whether that's regular real estate or whether that's flipping properties or a number of other things. And sometimes folks think that it's a easy thing to get into, but then folks also sometimes find that it's not as easy as they think yep. it is. So what advice would you give to folks that are thinking that they want to get into real estate, even if they're thinking about mm-hmm. the possibility of buying a property that is um, in less than prime condition and doing some repairs on it and then trying to flip it, because that's basically what flipping is yep. and everything. Yep. But what is some yep. of the uh, advice that you would give to folks that are thinking about going into those kind of uh, endeavors? Yep. So anything anything in regards to real estate, it's all about preparation and education and capitalization and having resources. When we, when we're talking about uh, purchasing properties that need work or properties that, that people are looking to to flip, they're looking to turn them, turn them over quickly. uh, We need education before we get into this. There's a lot in that process. Uh, there is a lot that we can't foresee when we get into a renovation or reconstruction, that kind of thing. Uh, we don't know what's going to go wrong. I mean, things could go very right. Uh, either way, it's just all about, again, learning, get some books, read about it, take classes. There are, there are a lot of great experts out there who can help. There are organizations to join for people who are uh, – who. For example, if someone wants to get into commercial property, there are, there are organizations to join where they have a lot of resources and can pass on a lot of knowledge. But, again, I think it's just all about taking the time to really learn and talk to experts. Find out what they have done. Find out how they did it. What are the risks? I mean, definitely we want to find out what are the risks, what could happen. And, and I think it all comes back, though, to education and uh, not just jumping into stuff blindly. No, that makes a lot of sense, as I was saying. I was yeah. actually just talking to some friends of mine a couple of days ago. Actually, one of them I was talking to yesterday, now that I think about it. But they are actually doing a uh, – building, they're actually renovating the house that they're moving into. So they're not planning to flip it. They are moving into the house with the house and needed a lot of work. And so they are laying down floors. They are laying down a lot of other things. And I was actually teasing them because they have uh, relatively young kids. One of the kids might be a little bit older than the other. So they might be like a preteen versus the other kids that are definitely younger. And I was asking them whether they were getting the kids involved in the construction and I think the kid that is the oldest one, they've gotten the kid involved in the construction, and that kid actually did a little bit of damage. So they would think they were doing something with their bathroom and things of that nature. So then they had yeah. to call the other people in order to fix what the kid has damaged because the kid was trying to be helpful but messed up the kind of helpful vibe and everything. So they had yeah. to wind up calling somebody to help them out in that situation. So I remember Telly and Aya telling me that they were glad to have the kids involved in helping them, but they didn't need that kind of help going on. But they are definitely, uh, I've seen pictures of the house, and it, it definitely looks like a work in progress. I think they're trying to have it done by the end of the year so they can move in like the first of 2021. But the pictures I've seen, they don't look like they're that close. But maybe maybe I'm looking at the pictures wrong, and they're a lot uh, closer than I actually think they are because they were telling me that they plan to have it done, and I'm pretty much sure that they said by the 31st. It might have even been by Christmas time, but like all I know is when I look at the pictures, I'm going like, that looks like y'all still got a lot of work to do. So, like I said, maybe I'm not visualizing what they're visualizing, or maybe they're planning to do these 24-hour marathon sessions that are going to get it done a lot quicker than they expect it to be yeah. done. But I know I was, I know the pictures I saw, I wasn't quite seeing a 31st completion date, but I could be wrong. <laughs> well, that's really exciting, and and that's a great way. To get some instant equity in a home purchase, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, putting that putting that sweat equity into a home, and believe me, I've done it myself. And and uh, and it, it's just a great way to purchase a home, and just to have that that value just go up immediately. Yep, and I've I've even seen people do that. Um, and I guess you could do it to some degree, but I've seen people try to do that, adding some 
enhancements even if they're like I live in an apartment and I've even seen people try to enhance apartments but then I guess you've got to do clearance with the apartment complex because yeah. you know if you had too much enhancement then uh, they're just going to ask you to take <laughs> it down and they're going to give you back the standard building that they were used to yeah. when they rented yeah. it to you and everything now if I'm sure you added like a uh, with their permission I'm sure if you added an extra uh, let's say a dishwasher or something like that and you left it yep. here when you left and they might go for that but you know leave it leave it some artwork i think that artwork probably needs to leave with you as well because i don't think that that artwork is going to go anywhere but in the dumpster if they rent it out to the new person so that's just my thought on artwork and everything that they may be adding but what is your thoughts on what i just said do you think that if you're in an apartment you probably need to leave the uh, take the artwork with you when you're leaving out or use that as some other form of financing for your own projects? Hey, if, if someone, if they do some beautiful art, I say if, you, if they're in an apartment, just do it on a canvas and uh, take it with you when you go. Or And you'll get permission from the, the association or the landlord and see what, they'll, see what they'll let someone do. But, you know, when you're in an apartment, mobility is good. That way you know when when you uh, decide to go, you just take it with you and you're done. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think <laughs> more people probably need to do that. Just like you said, just put it on a canvas and take the canvas with you and live that way you can leave the white walls or the brown walls or whatever color the walls are yep. at your yep particular complex and everything so that makes a lot of sense and all of that what is one of the strangest financial requests that you have had somebody ask you because i'm sure that in every field you always get that one request that you said you're going like i cannot believe that they asked me that question so i'm wondering what is one of the weirder financial requests that you have had asked to you i had that's uh, it's, you're, it's gonna be i hope you think this is interesting i thought it was an unusual request, and then it happened a second time. Uh, so a couple of years ago, someone asked me how they could set up uh, a, a way for them to go into a cryogenic facility after they passed. And so uh, we developed a plan by, uh, through which they would be able to, to accomplish that. So uh, I guess that's becoming more of a – more of not exactly a common thing, but it's becoming more common because I actually had a second person ask me how to how to uh, figure out so that they could get cryogenically frozen uh, after they passed away. So I say that was my most unusual request, Mark. That was uh, that was something I wasn't expecting at the time, but then it happened a second time, as I said. So maybe it's going to happen a third time. <laughs> Third time will be the charm, and you'll be sitting there going, like, hey, this is a new trend. I can go, I yes. can market this new trend, and I can yes. just do, part, make this part of my financial planning packages and everything. Because yes. uh, Dean doesn't know this, but he really wants to know how he can get financially some uh, planning money. We were talking about the Guardians earlier, which apparently is this great space force. So I'm thinking that there's going to be somebody that's going to come along, not Dean, I'm just teasing Dean right now, but I'm yep. sure somebody's going to come along, and they're going to want to know how they can finance going either either on a space trip or joining the oh, Guardian. Yeah. So you, I'm sure that you haven't had that yet, but I've expected that as we go further into the 21st century, that somebody, particularly maybe one of these young millennials or Gen Z people, is going to ask you how they can finance these trips to space because last time I checked, none of them are cheap. They're not back there. They're very expensive. Oh, they, they are very expensive. And I'm sure that is going to be happening because as uh, different programs are developing with being able to leave the atmosphere and then eventually being able to take uh, commercial flights to the moon or who even knows in the future, I, I won't be around anymore, but what people are going to be able to do in the next, in a hundred years from now is going to be pretty amazing. So yeah, I, I definitely am sure that that is going to happen. That's going to be, that's going to be something that develops in the future as a trend. And I'm, um, you know, all these, all these new, uh, new services or new things that, that are coming up in terms of travel and, and our future and what, what we can do with our estate planning and our financial planning. Uh, it's pretty amazing what's going to be happening. No, I definitely agree with you on that. <laughs> what do you think will be some of the trends that folks can be looking for in terms of financial advice over, say, the next 5 to 10 years, 15 years, and if you're going to go out further into the 
50 yep. to 100 year marks. What are you? What do you see as some of the trends that we should be looking for in terms of financial planning? And then after you ask that, after you answer that question, then I'm curious to see what you see some of the trends will be musically and entertainment wise. But first, I want to know the trends financially. Sure, financially, the the trends that we're going to be seeing are uh, ways to optimize our tax efficiency. Ways to to make you know, what it comes down to, Mark, is not really what we make. It's how much, not how much we make, but how much we can keep. And I think going forward, we could all uh, at least pretty much agree that that going forward, taxes are are going to be an increasing uh, burden on our personal finances, and being able to mitigate them as much as possible uh, is going to be is going to be really important going forward. And that's something that that people are asking me about all the time, how to, yeah, how to just optimize and, and make their, the taxes as efficient as possible. Sorry, go ahead. No, that makes a lot of sense, and I definitely think that that's going to be something that folks are going to be looking for. I'm actually hoping that one day soon we'll just abolish the income tax, and then that will just solve that yep. entire problem. But I don't know that that's going to happen in this lifetime. But I do know that there are folks that are pushing for us to eliminate these kind of like, you know, the, that thing that we file for every April 15th yep. and just kind of like getting rid of that whole concept and everything. But I think that it seems like it's too embedded into the funding of our government. So I don't know that it will ever actually – happen maybe they'll decrease it but do you think that we'll ever see a day when there will be no filing of your income taxes on april 15th or in at all because like i said it's gotten pushed back a couple of times because of the pandemic and a couple of other times it's been pushed back for whatever reasons but do yep, you ever yep. think that we will see a day where it's not as much of a regular routine that's, that's a that's a great point i mean people are coming up today with with different ideas about how we could potentially structure uh, we don't. We can call them taxes. It, it can be. Uh, it can be. It could be a different approach to how we fund our government and how we fund uh, different programs. You know, it's everything. Whatever we think is important as a people, and I don't think we'll ever stop contributing to that. Maybe we'll do it in a different way. You know, maybe it won't be structured the way it is structured today. We might be able to figure out how to do it more equitably for everybody, which would be great. And uh, but I, I do think that as as a country and as as a people uh, that we do have certain things that are important to us and that we want for for all of us. And if if we want to maintain those those programs and and those services those uh, those things that we know that we have to have that we like to have, then we have to contribute to them in some way. So hopefully we'll be able to find a way that is both beneficial to the country and the running of the country and also beneficial to all of us as individuals and what we would, you know, what we want to do in our lives and, and uh, just maybe structure it differently than it is today. I think that's definitely a possibility. I mean, that's something very long-term. It could be 50, 60 years down the road or or maybe more like 40, but you know what I'm saying? It's not probably not going to happen tomorrow. So that, that's just something to to definitely think about. And then in terms musically, I mean, I would, in terms of what's going to happen when, when we open back up and we can have our theaters and our venues open again, hopefully we'll be, we'll be able to have at least the cultural diversity that we had in our musical scene uh, when COVID came upon us last, uh, mm-hmm. last winter and last early spring. And I would like to see even more people come into the music world and into the art world and just, just light it up light it up with their, their wonderful creativity and their, their wonderful passion for what they do and just come back stronger than ever and uh, just really grow uh, musically and grow and evolve the community so that we are, so that musicians and the thing and the, the role that musicians play in New York and in our country uh, becomes even more important because we need our artists. We need, People who are creative thinkers and who uh, who are who are obsessed with beauty and obsessed with with uh, with changing people's lives through art and making people's lives better through art. Uh, so that is my hope, Mark. That no, things I- will will be even better than they were before. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely hope that that uh, hope does come true and everything. One of the things that I'm concerned about, and I don't know whether you've thought about this from both a financial standpoint and a musical standpoint, is that 
a lot of people are speculating that when we open up, that we're going to have to open up with new precautions put in place, whether that's uh, yep. everybody wearing masks, whether that's everybody um, being tested before they come in, whether that's even tests that have to be administered before you go in. I know I was watching a yep. news special about a week or two ago, and they were showing, like, this monitoring equipment mm-hmm. that they would have to have you passed uh, on your body and everything to make sure that you yep, had had yep. the vaccine and all of that before you even go into a big coliseum to watch, say, an NFL or a college football game and all of that. Yep. That being said, we do know that, unfortunately, a lot of times the venues pass those costs on to the customer. Yep. So I'm wondering, is there, in your mind, as both a person that is in the musical field, still considers yourself definitely a musician, as well as a financial advisor, do you have a fear that we might see a bump in cost as well? Because a lot of people are already complaining yep. about the cost as it was, and now you're going to add, say, an extra 2 or $3 based on whatever the equipment is that you need, to, meaning the venues. Yeah, it's definitely something that I've thought about and that I've heard discussions about, that ticket prices could be increased. And and it's something that I certainly hope doesn't happen. If if something has to happen because of all the regulations and guidelines that we have to follow, uh, my my hope is that we will somehow be able to overcome that and still be able to, excuse me, have uh, have our theater productions and and have them be at least similar in cost to what they were before COVID started. Uh, that if they have to open at half capacity or something like that, it could be. That could be a really tall order and might be impossible. But, I mean, that is my hope, that we can somehow work around that. I, I, I mean, we don't want to make these live experiences out of reach. And we, ha- to, you know, we, want to still, we still want to connect with people and with audiences. And I think we have to be really creative about how we do that uh, from now on, at least until we get through this in the next couple of years. So, I mean, it would, of course, it would be – the hope that 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 wouldn't happen but of course it could happen and depending on how we reopen it, it there's a very good chance of that yeah because i guess one of my other fears and i've actually got friends in the virtual reality as well as the uh AI spaces and all of that, but I guess my other fear is that we might start creating more of those Michael Jackson kind of like concerts and things of that nature, meaning yep, that you're not yep. actually seeing the live person right there, for right. one, enjoy the live experience and uh, seeing the live musicians, seeing their body language, watching the chemistry between the musicians as well as the chemistry between the musicians and the audience, and I'm not knocking virtual spaces and computer spaces, but it doesn't have that yep. same energy to me, but as we move further into the space age and into the 21st century, and as we're dealing with the consequences of the pandemic, I'm afraid that we might see more of these kind of uh, hologram type shows and everything that are not the fully capturing the art of the artist, but that might just me and my fears. I was wondering, do you have similar kind of fears that we might see more of these technical kind of concerts that aren't the same as the true live performances? Yep. I think we are. I think that's going to be a reality. I, I think uh, we're going to be we're going to be able to once we once we really get going with, as you're saying, the holographic technology, probably be able to sit in our living rooms and experience something of a live performance. It's not the same as being there in person, right. definitely, uh, but maybe maybe it's somewhere in between uh, where we're, you know, com- as compared to watching something that's been recorded. Uh, and versus some, you know, something that's live, where we're there actually live. So I think it's something that is going to benefit people in a way because people all over the world would be able to experience that version of a live performance, while, although they're not there in person. And it could have a very, a very strong feeling of being there, but it's, you know, you're not exactly there. But I think that could be a benefit in that many, many more people could be reached compared to today where we have to be actually there uh, at, in the geographical location to experience a live performance. So, I mean, that could be a benefit. And it, it's also, uh, it's hopefully we won't totally get rid of the live part, though, because I'm with you, Mark. I love being in, in a live, uh, going to live performances and uh, just being there is something, that feeling is something that you really can't, replicate not yet anyway and uh if we if we ever get to that point then i'm I'm all for it but i agree with you i think it's going to be a combination 
of the two. And, you know, some people are going to be, want to be at home and, and get that, get somewhat of that in my, in, in person experience. And then other people are always going to want to go totally in person, I think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and definitely agree with you on that. Um, coming back to the financial stuff and everything, do you think that we – will the Social Security, because I know that's been another thing that a lot of folks have yeah. been concerned about, do you think Social Security will still be around 10 to 15 years? We've been paying into the Social Security, or do you yeah. think that it's on the way out? So do, what is your feeling about the future of Social Security? I think Social Security in one form or another is definitely going to be around – uh, it would be to me it would be politically untenable for anyone to do away with the social security with the program because it is something that uh people have been contributing to their entire working lives their entire adult lives and and to just get rid of it uh it do- doesn't seem like it could it could happen it, it's going to the program's probably going to change it's the benefits are probably going to change uh maybe they would decrease over time, you know, we'll have to see what happens with that. But I do believe it's going to be there in one form or another. It's just what is that form going to be? And I think all of us who are anticipating receiving Social Security benefits need to really understand what role the Social Security benefit plays in our retirement planning. Because Social Security was never meant to be a complete replacement of income. It's a replacement. Of, it was intended to be a replacement of up to about 40% of income. So, you know, it was never meant to totally replace income. It's a, it's a, it's a bridge. It's something that closes up a gap. So it's going, it's always going to be, I believe it's always going to be there for a partial part of our income replacement, but it's not going to ever be enough to replace our working income. So we have to think about how are we going to do that? How are we going to replace the rest of our income? How are we going to have the the income streams or revenue streams or or build up assets to be able to do that? So that it's a huge challenge today. Uh, It's something that we all need to address as much as we can and, and just think smart about it and make plans and you're not hide from it, but face it head on and really think about, what are we going to do to get from point A to point B? And depending on how much time we have, because time, when we have it, it's on our side. And when we don't have it, it's not on our side. And uh, time is the most important thing when it comes to that kind of planning. And we can certainly uh, bring Social Security income into the planning, but it can't be the whole picture. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the things I've heard people talk about, and I've actually got friends that have uh, – Young children, like in that Gen Z category, probably even some of those other generations that are near there. So they're like between my nephew's ages and they are um, 12 and 11 and everything yep. on up to like the early 20s and everything of that nature and even some into their 30s. But they are oftentimes frustrated by those of us that are into the 50s and even definitely those that are in our parents' generation, meaning that they're in their 70s and everything, because they're feeling like that a lot of the older folks are still working. And they was, and yep. basically they're like, would y'all stop working because we can have our time yep. in the work yep. field and everything of that nature. So I was wondering, is that something that you're also dealing with as a financial advisor? Because you were talking about how Social Security was supposed to be 40% of our um you know, our planning into the retirement yep. years, into those vacation years before going off into the sunset and all of that, yep. you know, hopefully making it to the Evelyn Gates and all of that kind of stuff. But in that bridge time, which is supposed to be all about travel and just kind of like having that, uh, I call it, or some people may call it their second teenage years or whatever, that kind of freedom. A lot of people are working well into their 70s and 80s. I've got friends of mine that work at the testing company, the um educational testing company that I work for that are definitely in their 70s. Some might even be pushing yep. in their 80s, and I don't think that they have any plans to stop because they like to have that uh, exercise their brains and can keep and also have that social company that jobs provide and everything. So yep. it seems that we're moving into this area where a lot of people are working well into their 70s and 80s and having no problems working into their 70s and 80s. But I was wondering how that's impacting you as a financial advisor, and are you hearing complaints from those young people about some folks working into what they feel are beyond the ages that they yeah. would like them to work? That, that is such, a, such an interesting topic, and it is something that I've heard 
uh, people in their 20s and 30s talk about because people in their 60s and 70s are now working longer. My, my, my father-in-law has been working. He's, he's 88. He's still working. He has his own business, but he's still working in his own business. Uh, there, there are a lot of people out there who, uh, whether because they want to, they're, they're still working. I mean, a lot of people love their work. They, they, they're right. privileged to work. They enjoy working. They don't want to stop. They're, uh, they're doing great, and they want to keep going. So uh, they are keeping going with their work. Uh, sometimes people choose to keep working, but they back it down a little bit. They'll right. maybe, take, maybe be doing 60% of what they used to do uh, in their in their later 60s and early 70s. And I, I think it is a challenge for younger people because <clears throat> that wasn't the case up until like the last 15 or so years, 15, 20 years, right? And I, I really feel that uh, we have to make, we have to be creative. We have to make more opportunities. We, we, can't, we can't just say, oh, these people are working longer. Uh, you know, what are we going to do? We have to make the opportunities for ourselves. It, it's, it's partially, at least partially up to us to create our own futures. And I think we have to get really creative with that and, uh, and embrace people who want to keep working and also embrace younger people who are looking for advancement or ways to improve their careers. So it's, it's got to come from both sides of that, of that coin, of that story. And I think it's totally possible to, to make that work. And people, you know, people are working for, for different reasons and if they if there's you know they want to keep working or they have to keep working they should have the opportunity to keep working because you know we're not uh, you know good work is something that we should we should applaud and appreciate and be able to appreciate their their uh, their experience and the the level of depth that they bring to their work because they they have been they have experience in the workforce uh, for so many years so. I think we can all uh, come together and come up with some with some great ideas and, and ways to move forward that, forward with that. And you know that's something that we've experienced in music as well. And uh, it's something that that we can definitely work through. I mean, it's, that's that's a that's a good problem to have. Like people who want to work, and we can make that we can make that better definitely. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. We can definitely make it better. Now, the other thing that I oftentimes hear people talk about when they think about financial planning and financial life in general is the fact of, you know, we were talking about budgeting earlier and when you first called and everything and how the personal budgets, people are oftentimes amazed at the personal budgets and what we have to do in order to budget tighten and everything. But then we hear, the, you know, big government that always seems to come up with these big debts and these big things that they never seem to hardly ever balance their budget yep. so how do you actually when you're talking to your clients how do you get them to uh understand for lack of a better term this dichotomy that seems to go on because like i said i don't care whether it's state government i would even argue in some cases your local government whether that's <laughs> in new jersey whether that's here in durham or whether that's in yep. uh california or definitely on the national level and then we're telling folks to you know tight uh tighten their belts and everything, yep. make sure that they're doing everything right and all of that, but their people that are above them in terms of the government don't ever seem to do that, and even some of the businesses that they, that they work for don't seem to do that as well. So I'm sure that, that comes up in your conversation with your clients. So how does it come up, and how do you give them to understand the dichotomy of what's going on? Because it seems to me that that oftentimes happens is that, you know, the bosses, whether that's your corporation that you're working for or definitely our government, don't always seem to do the same thing that they always tell us to do. Yeah, that, that, is, a, a real, that is a source of questions and uh, interest a lot with my clients, definitely. And it's, it's hard to compare our personal finances with government finances because the, our personal finances are, are pretty simple. Even if we have a business and – different things going on, investments, things like that, it's still fairly simple compared to what it takes to, to run a state or run the United States for that matter. And what, what we're trying to accomplish in terms of our goals and take a year like this year with our short-term goals of, of uh, relief from forced uh, uh, losing jobs and things like that, closing businesses, not being able to operate, 
that that is something where the government is uh, doing things that that we can never that we will never have to do on the personal on a personal level, and we have to balance. You know, if we ever can balance our, our national budget and balance the state budget, that's going to be over a long period of time and taking into account uh, so many variables like COVID and, and now our unemployment and, and different things like that, that that are just almost uncountable, almost innumerable. And when we think about our personal finances, it's really about building wealth, um, Use, if we need to use debt, use it to our advantage. Uh, there, all debt is not bad. There is good debt and there is bad debt. And just keeping a balance so that we have a budget we're living within and we are able to save, we're able to grow our wealth, we're able to have different kinds of investments. We have different, we can take advantage of different opportunities. If something unexpected comes along, we're protected. Uh, when we when we're talking about our personal finances, you know, versus the the macroeconomic situation with the with the United States government and state government, we're just on a completely different level there in terms of complexity. And uh, you know, at least we can uh, we have a good chance of, of balancing our own budgets and making that work and being able to reach our goals financially and, and also our other goals in life, which are all connected. And uh, that's that's pretty much what we focus on. But I agree with you. That's that's certainly a question that comes up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that was a question that came up. I know that uh, Dean, and I'm going to let Dean chime in. I'm sure he's got some questions that he might want to share as well. But Dean just wants you to balance the budget for the Baltimore Ravens. So he needs the Baltimore Ravens <laughs> to make it into the playoffs because he's a diehard Baltimore Ravens fan. All and right, right now, they're on the outside looking in. I think they're a game back, but we're hoping that they're going to go ahead and win so that D will be happy. Right, D? We've moved into the wild card spot, so we should be fine right now. We got so y'all look good games. right now. Yep, we're good <laughs> right now. Two more right, games. So they're awesome. good right now. They're good right now, so that's a good thing. I know that a good friend of mine was worried about the Jets because he wanted them to tank for Trevor because he wanted them to lose all of their games, and what did they do? <laughs> they went ahead and won a game. So they, now, he's, now he's a little upset because he's like, wait a minute, we're supposed to be tanking so we can get Trevor and get that great player. So now he's trying to figure out if they're going to lose that pick to Jacksonville and all of that. So that being said, just have a little sports talk there for a minute and everything. But, Dean, what are your thoughts about all this financial and musical knowledge that you are Gardner and, and all of that. You are a business person as well. You and your wife have businesses, so I'm sure that it's, and she's up there. Jill is in New Jersey. So this is your opportunity to ask a financial question that has been crossing your mind all day long. I don't really have any financial questions. I just hope that they eliminate student loans, the debt that's owed on those, and that we don't have to file any taxes anymore. We, I, I'll be fine. <laughs> as far as that, you know, I'll be able to save some more money, um, you know, and I'll be able to uh, travel more. So, you know, a lot of people want to save, and, and it sounds nice when some people say, oh, you know, always save, but then they don't save anything. Usually they'll buy all kinds of stuff that have no significant value, or, you know, they'll say, well, um, they say all of the right things, but then when you look, some people aren't the words and the actions don't match up. And, and a lot of times with our own government, the words and the actions don't match up because sometimes you want to say, Hey, look, okay. So where is this money actually going? Who is it going to, and how is it going to be used? And they'll say, Oh, well, you know, right now we're working on a stimulus plan. That's not what I asked you. You know, I, we know the pandemic has shut down a lot of things. Also, with the ability of individuals to earn money in, in cases where businesses are folded, and unfortunately, now they have no job. So what do they do? You know, and, and it's a tough situation to be in because if they never saved like they said they should have, you run into a problem, you know, and you run it, I'll say you run into a problem faster than you would have had you put something away for emergent purposes. In this instance, this is very emergent because 
We don't know when it's leaving. Sure, there's a vaccine out now, but what's going to come down behind that? You know, how are some of these businesses going to be able to bounce back or even recover from the damage that's been done through no fault of their own? So, you know, it's it's kind of tricky, you know, and then different types of life insurance and, you know, they want you to get this policy, but then they don't tell you certain things happen after you pass away where you figure all of that money is going to your family. So it's kind of really, you know, you got to really pay attention to what will better serve you and for those who don't have a clue of where to start, that's where the financial planners come into play and, and to guide you and to, to put you in a position where you you will be all right, you know. So it's definitely a service that's needed and a definitely a service that, that is very helpful because people claim to know about money, but then people don't know about money, if you understand that statement. You know, so yep. they, they, they'll, they'll tell you about, oh, yeah, I do this and I do this. And then next thing you know, later on, you hear him talking about something like, nah, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, dang, you just talked to me about an hour about all these other things that makes logical sense. But it's often easier for a person to give advice than for them to follow it themselves, too. So, you know, when you look at that, all right, make sure you put yourself in a position so that, you know, you're not looking at your family like, I don't know what we're going to do or I give up or any, you know, anything like that. So you got to just be kind of careful. No, I definitely agree with you on that. And you actually brought up something interesting, Dean, and I, we alluded to it earlier. But um, what are you hearing, Jill, about student for, uh, loan forgiveness and all of that? And is that going to come down the pike like hopefully with us getting rid of taxes? Because I do agree that that's something that we should have done a long time ago. And there's a number of folks that unfortunately are stuck in debt well after they've graduated from school because yep. of student loans and all of that. Because a lot of times they do these kind of reconstructions of the amount, and sometimes those fade out and in a favor. So I know that I still have some money that I still owe, and I graduated some 30-plus years ago. So uh, well, actually, it's come to think of it, 84, yeah, 30-plus years ago, almost 40. And there's still some money out there that I still owe and everything, and I'm not alone in that category. There's some other folks that graduated many moons ago as well. So what are you hearing about those possibilities? Well, it's something that, as you both know, is being discussed a lot. And I, I think in terms of whatever happens, with the decision from the federal government, it's very important for people to leave their student loans as student loans. Do not change them into something else by either refinancing them into something connected to a home, a home mortgage, something like that, or a personal loan. I've heard of people uh, refinancing into a personal loan. So we want to keep them as student loans and so that if something does happen in terms of the the relief for student loans, then they're they're going to be able to help with that. If we change it into something else, then we're done. Uh, it's it's this new kind of loan forever. So I, I say that would be the most important thing to do. And um, hopefully down the road, I mean, if we can have some relief with that and have some changes in that system, I think it would be really beneficial to – our entire country because so many people around the country are suffering with their student loans. They're paying as much for their student loans as they are for their home mortgage, for their home mortgage or for their rent uh, on a monthly basis, which, which is just shouldn't be that way. So, you know, if anyone, if anyone is in that situation, uh, they should reach out to people who can potentially help them. There are some great people out there helping people, uh, into better situations with their student loans. I also still have a student loan left, still working on that, and uh, we just wanna we just wanna get that down to a manageable amount on a monthly basis, and hopefully something good will happen on the federal level, and we'll have to see what happens with that. No, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the other things that uh, we kind of alluded to when I gave that little sports uh, break and everything was I'm oftentimes <laughs> amazed by the fact that. Too often, our we talked about the entertainers, but also too often our athletes 
uh, don't necessarily have like a plan of their financial future, even though yep. they get these big time contracts and all of that kind of stuff, but they don't necessarily have a business plan and they also don't necessarily yep. have a financial plan. So I was wondering in your own career, if you've ever had to deal with any of these entertainers and if so, yep. what kind of advice do you give them? Because I oftentimes am amazed at the ones that might go to work for like the Jets or the uh, you know, the Yankees in baseball or some of these other things and have million, if not million dollar contracts, or maybe not billion, but definitely million dollar contracts. Yep. And they're sitting there and you know they're letting their parents, their cousins, yep. and everybody else tell them what to buy, what business to go into, without having yep. any sort of plan involved in that. So I was just wondering your thoughts on that and whether you've had he had to deal with those athletic types that may not have that financial backing and the financial plans in place. I have, I have had, I do have uh, clients who are athletes and in entertainment at a very high level. And it's really important for them, as you were saying, Mark, to have professional guidance. It's uh, of course, we need our families around us that our families are definitely our support system and they should be involved if, if that's what the what the performer and the entertainer wants, the athlete wants, they should be involved in uh, helping with decisions. But we, we definitely need professionals to come in who can develop a business plan, who can develop a uh, personal and and a personal plan and have the two aligned. Uh, I think it's really important in that situation, especially if if the length of the career is uncertain, to to do as much as possible to uh, build strength and, and grow their wealth quickly and to to do that with the same principles that uh, I talk about all my clients with in terms of their finances. It's not what we make, it's what we keep. How can we keep more? How can we make our futures better by keeping more today? And if we're in a situation where we're thinking we might have a a 10-year career or maybe a 15-year career. I mean, maybe we could have a much longer career than that, but it's it's not set in stone. And I think it's smart to, to focus on building wealth quickly. And uh, again, no matter what we make, everybody needs a budget. Stick to that budget. Make sure that savings is built into the budget. Make it real. Make it a habit. And focus on that and proceed in that direction. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and I definitely can uh, relate to that. I've actually got um, – I've known for years uh, – <laughs> more as an acquaintance and as a true friend. Uh, but we went to school together, Doc Rivers and everything, who's now the coach of the 76ers. But I remember even way back when he was playing for Atlanta, he got involved in a number of business ventures that actually was helping him create the kind of wealth that he's still able to maintain. So even though he's had these kind of contracts, whether it was as a player or as a coach, as he is now, but definitely he's always had outside business ventures. And most of them that I've been able to see from the outside looking in, looked like they were uh, business ventures that made sense. Like, you know, sometimes the guy yep. can get you involved in a business that doesn't make any sense, but these look like business ventures that actually made sense, not necessarily like, you know, the neighborhood lot that wasn't going to make any money because it's in the wrong neighborhood. So it looks like he was actually doing some research into the businesses that he decided to get involved in. And I yep. think that that's what more and more folks need to do. I get the impression, and I know him not at all, but I get the impression that that's kind of the attitude that LeBron James has, whether it's with his school or whether it's with some of his business ventures, but they seem like they are actually engaged in the study of what they are doing as business yep. person and not just as entertainers. So they definitely see themselves yep. as entertainers and athletes because a lot of times there's a fine line between an athlete and an entertainer and that kind of sport and everything. But definitely I think that they've done great research in the kind of businesses that they get involved in. And I wish that more of our up and coming musicians and our up and comer uh, athletes and sports figures would do the same. Cause I have seen heard of a number of cases where you're sitting there going like, what were you thinking about when you got into that business? And did you not at least consult with your financial planner? Did you not at least call Jill? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Definitely. It, it's so important. It's so important. Really. It's uh, it, it's, it's gotta be good guidance, trustworthy guidance, uh, professionals along with, the, the athlete or the entertainer and their support system. And everybody works together, you get a great result. 
speaking of which, if folks are listening, they've been listening now for a while, and we're getting ready to wrap up and everything. And by the way, Isabel, I was hoping to have her call in, and she's done some work in entertainment as well. But I know that she was at checking out a Christmas show, so she probably still got caught up in that show. So I'll have to connect y'all to at some point, and maybe have y'all on a upcoming episode in the, the near future and all of that. And I was also hoping that Santa Claus was going to call because he told me he was going to call when I saw him yesterday, but he probably got caught up to wrapping toys and getting everything lined up. So maybe he'll call us after the fact on the day after Christmas or a couple of days after Christmas next week. So those were two of the folks that I was also hoping to join us today, but you have been a great guest and everything. But that being said, how can folks reach you if they're interested in getting your services and all of that? So is there a email or a contact or website that folks can learn about how to reach Jill? Thank you, Mark. It's been a real pleasure to be here and speak with you both. Um, I I would just say give me a call. I'm at 201-921-4718. That's the easiest way to reach me. I have email, of course, but my last name's really long, so (laughs) I won't won't, uh, say it right now. But it's, uh, it's, you know, anyone has any questions, feel free to give me a call. I'm happy to help. Sounds great, and I'm sure folks will be listening, and they might be blowing up that phone and seeing about giving uh, getting some advice from you and all of that. One of the things that I try to do on just about all of the shows, whether it's this one or whether it's one of the uh, streaming shows that I do, is I always try to give my guests an opportunity to share their words of encouragement, their words of wisdom, their words of positivity that they would like to share with the world. So as we wrap up in the last four minutes or so, if you've got any words of encouragement or words of positivity that you would like to share, I'm sure folks would love to hear that. I'd say just very simply, we can do this, everybody. We can work together. We're going to make it through this. We're going to we're going to just succeed and grow and evolve. And let's just work together. Let's educate and let's elevate. Definitely some great words of encouragement. I'm sure a lot of folks can definitely relate to that. We definitely need to be trying to elevate each other on a regular basis and all of that. Oh, you did mention earlier that your place that you play at might have a concert sometime in 2021. So where would that be at if folks wanted to see you perform? So I just I forgot to get to that part as well. So I remember you mentioned a place in New Jersey that they still have you on the roster. So if they want to see you perform, will that be in the spring or would that be in the summer and what is the name of that venue i would say look out for a summer concert in tinicum park right across the delaware river uh from frenchtown new jersey it's the riverside symphonia it's a beautiful orchestra we have a great uh concert every summer outdoor in the park set up a beautiful bandstand and have fireworks And that's probably the first possible time that we will be able to play again. And then hopefully next fall, next winter, we'll be able to get our our season back to normal. Sounds great, and I will have to try to make a trip up that way. And Dean's even closer, so he'll have to go over there and uh, bring the wife and uh, bring the family, the grands and everything, and check out a concert in the park once we're back to normal. What do you think, Dean? You think you'll head over that way and check out one of your New Jersey folks are uh, doing a great event? And by the way, I keep teasing Dean because I'm doing more jobs of booking New Jersey people than Dean is doing. And Dean's actually in New Jersey, so he's got to do a better job. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but what do you think, Dean? You're going to go check out the concert and everything along those lines? Because definitely it sounds like it could be an amazing concert, and hopefully everything will be back to normal in the, the uh, springtime or definitely in the summertime. So if everything is done and we're back into some semblance of normality, you think you'll grab the family and go hear some good old-fashioned classical music? But well, we'll see what happens. We'll Come on, happens. Dean. Let me, know. <laughs> Let me know. I'll meet up with you. We'll we'll have have some uh lemonade and uh have some, some great uh outdoor activities and uh have a good concert. That'll work. 
Sounds like it could be a great concert, so we're just going to have to have that encouragement going on and all of that. So as I said, we got about a minute to go, and we're getting ready to wrap everything up. Dean, you want to tell folks where they can hear this replay at and where they can also um, get uh, our other shows and some of the other shows that we've got on this tremendous network that we have put together here on Blog Talk Radio. So you want to share with folks a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Why not? You know what I mean? We we can get all of that. Uh-oh. I hear I hear something in the background. I don't know if that's on my end or on another end, but we we thank you first of all for for joining us tonight. Um giving us some good information and helping us along the way. Any help that we get is, is Greatly appreciate it. Hopefully our listeners have been taking some kind of notes as well so that they can, if they do need to reach out to you, they give you a call and, and get some advice to, to get them onto the uh, right track that they are, that they need to be on, I should say. So, ladies Thank and you. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, and, and, and thank you for taking that time, you know, to – Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and all of the things that you do. It's greatly appreciated, as Mark has said, and, and I'll say it again, you know, but thank you. Okay? My pleasure. So, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, this Straight Talk with Dana Mark, Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make sure you catch the replays tomorrow and Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. on the Skyhawk Radio Network. And if you missed that, then we do have replays, and we have a whole bunch of them. And it's um, trying to find that list because my brain just got a, a complete wipe, but it's on, on Radio Public, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, Castbox, Pod Follow, Deezer, J Saving, and right here on Blog Talk Radio, we are part of the Level Podcast Network, where you can find also the shows The Black Girls Guide to Surviving Menopause, the Chef Gang Radio Show, Funk from the Front Seat, Funk Music with Zach, Learning Unwrapped, Let's K 12 Better, Marketing with Russ. Hashtag Rush Selfie. Mona Shakes and the Minority Reports. Mulling Music and Memories with Mark Lee. The Online Dinner Party with Mark Lee. The Reinvention Road Trip. She's on Call. The Just Podcast. The Mark Lee Show. The Spinach Social Hour. Virginia Interfaith Live. And WNC Original Music. Last but not least, us right here. Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. Like I always say, when you walk outside your front door, it's showtime in the world of your stage. Just make sure that people are not watching the rehearsal. With that being said, it's Six Man Dean Geronimo. Have an outstanding week. We see y'all for the last time in 2020 in seven days. And hopefully 2021 will be a much better year than 2020 was because 2020 was rocky. We know that 2021 will at least start off rocky, but hopefully it will continue to improve and be a better year than 2020 was because 2020 was a wild one. That's all I got to say. It was definitely a wild one, and we need to have some improvement in 2021 and beyond. So if we're going to have some new things coming into place in 2021, like a new administration and some new changes on a lot of different levels. But one thing that we'll stay consistent where we will continue to bring you some great guests. So still lining up the guests for that last show on the 28th, but I will have some more amazing folks. And who knows? Maybe Jill will call back in again and have some great comments as well. But we'll definitely have some other guests as well. But definitely it should be an amazing show as we wrap up the year on 12-28 and get ready to slide on in into 12-21. So 2021 is coming our way. 2021 is going to be coming up in, what is that, 11 days from 11, now? No, yeah, 11 10 days, days, brother. Today's the 21st. So 10 more That's days. Right, 10 days from now. That's right. And it's over. 10 days left to 2020 and 11 days to 2021. Exactly. That's <laughs> it.
So y'all keep it right. right. Keep it right. We see y'all next week. Sounds great. We will catch you later.